recording there. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so yeah, first to introduce like, um, like why tech companies or like, what is a tech company? And like, obviously there's the big names you heard, you guys have all heard of, you know, like the Googles and the Facebooks and whatever. Um, um, but just beyond like reputation and like the brand name, um, something I would say that is beneficial is that like, there's a difference between working at a company where the engineer or, you know, the, the product manager is like the focus rather than, you know, maybe some other roles being the focus. So for example, like, um, uh, I know someone who's worked at Chase and the, the vibe and just how, how things go, like the culture is very different when, you know, maybe the, like the finance side is the, is the centric, the center piece of the company uh, versus when the engineers are. Uh, let's see. So yeah, some curious to go over. There's obviously like engineering. So most likely it's what a lot of computer science majors go into or like software engineering. You have data science, machine learning. Um, there's product, um, design, UI, UX, and then many, many others. Like you don't even have to do a like engineering focused role at these companies. Like you can work as like a finance major in Google or you can work in, you know, marketing, sales, et cetera. That all works. How I um, so find the, the first step, I guess, is to find companies that you want to apply to. And the, like beyond all the companies that you guys have just heard off the top of your head, it's like all the brand names you know, um, you can like, obviously there's the companies you know, you can ask around. So where your friends work, where your friends are applying. Um, and you can also do a lot of research online. Um, I'll, I will give out some links later. Um, but yeah, so for most positions, um, you can look at their website, look what they're offering. Um, if there's, um, this is like a big one. I think a lot of people are pretty comfortable or familiar with, you know, like going to the Google homepage and seeing like what roles they're offering or what internships they're offering. But, um, sometimes it's good to seek out like a smaller company if that's what you're interested in. And the nice thing about these smaller companies is sometimes you can directly shoot an email just to, uh, if they have a link posted or an email that's publicly available and someone will directly respond to you. And that's the nice thing about like these smaller companies is there's no chance of you email like Google or Facebook, they're not going to get back to you. Uh, and yeah, Facebook groups as well. Um, so a uh, couple, these sites will be available, but there's a couple of nice websites. Uh, there's payinterns.nyc. This is for like, obviously NYC based companies. If you want to stay local, um, there's a lot of, uh, this is for design focused, but there's like digital creative agencies. Um, and yeah, just in general, find work that is, you're interested in, obviously. Um, if possible, don't just, you know, take the first job you see. Um, so I'll go into like company sizes. So um, there's obviously the gigantic companies you guys have all heard of, like the Amazons and the Googles. Um, there were mid, there's mid-stage startups, like unicorny companies maybe. So if you've heard of like Uber or Lyft, um, and then smaller companies. So any startup or even like smaller companies that are local based and yeah. And then you can even work for things like um, a startup accelerator or like these really, really early um, companies that like just got funding. Um, and the big thing is like, it's nice if you can, before you graduate to get like a taste of all of these, because then you can get a good idea of like the different cultures be between these kinds of companies and you know what you like. Um, and beyond that, like, yeah, it's, it, I think it's a pretty good experience if you can, you know, go to a big company, go to a mid-sized company and see, also maybe you can go to a company where the engineering is the focus versus where en en the engineers are not. Um, so first up, like early stage startups, um, you guys might have ho heard of AngelList or now it's called Angel, angel.co. Um, it just has a gigantic list of startups and uh, startups that are looking for interns or just jobs in general. Uh, there's... These, there's other like pretty big long lists of you know startups that are available. I'll link that after. And then there's venture capital firms, accelerators, incubators. Um, generally speaking, it's better if you find a startup with funding because there's a higher chance you'll get paid. <laughs> but um, yeah. Um, next up, we have the big companies and the tech giants you guys have all heard of. You know the Googles, the Facebooks. Um, they're they might be overrated, but the, the nice thing about having like a big company on your resume is that it is, it's much, it's much simpler to go from a very prestigious or reputable, comp 
reputable company to any other. So for example, that first jump from like, you know, like Apple or Facebook to, you know, a startup will make your resume since after that internship or that first work experience, your resume looks much more attractive. Obviously you can kind of have the flexibility to go wherever you want. And that's obviously a huge bonus. Um, but yeah, there's, there might, there might also be a lot of big companies you guys like aren't even on the top of your mind. So, you know, like IBM, Twitter, Salesforce, these kinds of companies, um, just be, be, be sure to do your research. Um, next up, there's the mid-sized companies. So not quite the tech giants or these gigantic companies, but um, a lot of these you've probably heard of, like the Airbnbs, like your Stripes, Squares, um, Lyft. A lot of these are probably, most of these are probably based in California along with the tech giants. Um, the nice thing about the mid-sized companies is that the compensation is usually just as competitive, if not better than, you know, the tech giants because they are, you know, already unicorns and they have funding. Um, the culture will be pretty distinct, I think, among these companies, which is good because you get a taste of different kinds of companies. And yeah, there's lots of potential for growth. So if you end up going full time, the stock is probably worth a lot, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, and then lastly, you know, local smaller companies based in New York. I mean, well, uh, anything ranging from small to, to gigantic as well, just locally based companies. Um, the nice thing about applying local is that um, if you reach out to a recruiter, um, it's much easier to, to do an onsite interview. Obviously more difficult with the onset of coronavirus, but um, generally speaking, it's much easier to, because the company doesn't have to fly you out for an onsite interview when that happens. So, you know, you have your Buzzfeed, Etsy, Tumblr, Jiffy, et cetera. Um, yeah, so check out some of the links in the slide. And lastly, um, just to find out more about more companies, you know, and talk to more people, you know, obviously more difficult, but, you know, we had career fairs, um, conferences, you know, Facebook groups, um, NYU based clubs as well. And just, yeah, there are, I would say these links at the bottom are particularly useful. Um, there's like GitHub lists of just all the companies or all the companies people have found that have open applications. And yeah, I'll go over applying in just a bit. So yeah, thanks Lucas. Um, there's some also fellowship programs to look at, product design intern listings, check out these links. Um, and uh, I think one thing that's pretty important to mention is like, especially during coronavirus, like um, don't beat yourself up if you don't end your year with an internship. I think it's a pretty bad mindset to always compare yourself to others. Like, so if you feel that like, oh, your friends are interning or working and you're not, like don't feel inferior. It's not like, it's not a competition to make the most money out of all your friends or anything like that. Um, also, if you don't land an internship, that's honestly fine. Um, there are a lot of alternatives. Um, I would say the best thing you can do during your summer is work on something or do something that can result in something being on your resume. And um, I I'll just go from top down from, um, the quote unquote, like most, like best to worst, I guess. So obviously if we get an internship, that's great. Um, but moving down, research is great. Um, if you can do research, first of all, you, you know, the easiest way is to reach out to a professor and you know, ask if there's anything to work on. Um, it's, uh, it's really, really great if you had taken a class with a professor, because then talking to that person is much simpler, but you can also just, you know, go on a professor list and do cold emails and stuff like that. Um, other than that, so research is good, fellowships are good. Um, even working for a nonprofits is good. Like I know, I know someone who worked for um, a, a nonprofit company that like um, took in leftover food from restaurants and he worked on their website, which is, it's not something where you would think there's a job opportunity, but uh, there is. So um, if you take the opportunity to work and, and look for it, then you'll find it. Um, so applying. The, I think a lot of people mess up on the resume stage and hopefully you can learn something today. But so the, the most important thing is if you don't have like 10 years of experience, keep it to one page, like no, pretty much for us, no exceptions. Um, keep it pretty, keep it clean and keep it simple. Um, you know, name, email, major, if your GPA is above uh, three listed. Um, the best thing, so uh, I see, I've seen a lot of, um, especially, freshman and sophomore resumes where they'll list a lot of things like um, a lot of like jobs they took on in high school that don't really have anything related to software engineering. So let's just say you're applying for a software engineering role. Um, one of the biggest things I see is that they have a lot of roles that like 
maybe they worked as um, like a sales associate at like Hollister. I don't think it's the worst thing to put on your resume, but I don't think it also, I don't think it adds very much to your resume. So for example, if I am a recruiter or, and I'm looking at your resume, it doesn't tell me anything about your ability to code or do anything. Um, so I would say from most important is if you have work experience, obviously put it. If not, I would say, you know, your work projects are really, really important. So for example, like um, it, it's really, it's best if you can link your GitHub and have a project and show that you've made meaningful contributions to it. Um, so for example, uh, you guys might've done a lot of projects in, in class. I would try if possible, limit the number of class projects you list on there because um, if you have projects outside of school um, on your resume, it looks a lot better because it shows that um, the person, well, you are taking time outside of class to work on something you're passionate about. And it shows like, let, let, and if you're more direct about it and you just say like, oh, so, you know, I took this API and, and made this. And it shows, it shows that you're taking time outside of school to learn, like use new APIs and like you like to build things. And those are like qualities that people look for rather than if your resume is just four projects and they're all based off of like, you know, your data structures class, then it shows that then the recruiter gets this, I, this feeling that this guy took data structures and that's it. He doesn't do anything else. Um, so yeah, a big thing is if you can't find an internship, I would say um, taking the time to, you know, make a side project is really, really helpful because it, first, it gives you something to talk about when you're interviewing. And also it shows that, you know, it shows anyone who reads your resume, they get a better idea of, of you. You know, they, it shows that you are interested in working on things on the side. Um, and uh, yeah, list, list any of the tools, APIs, languages that you work with. Um, it's not like the more, the better. Like you're not, don't just list 30 languages. And, and even though you've only touched them for 10 minutes, um, I would say list the ones that you're actually proficient in. Um, other than that, um, if you have gone to a hackathon and you have your hackathon project, then list that. It shows, you know, you're doing more outside of school. If you've wanted something at a hackathon, even better. Um, other than that, yeah, I would list your coursework and maybe an interest line. Um, in general, these kinds of like interest lines are better for local companies because like a tech giant isn't going to read that you love to play guitar and they don't care. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so details. Yeah. So as I mentioned, like personal projects are great. Link them to GitHub. If you have a readme or a demo that's available, that's even better. Um, other than that, a nice way to get projects that are on your resume. Cause I'd imagine like me when I was like a freshman or a sophomore, I didn't have any projects on the side. Um, you can just think about like building anything you want. It doesn't need to be the most groundbreaking, amazing project. It can just be anything you're interested in. So like you can make a game, make a website, make anything, honestly, it just show people that you're doing that you're coding outside of school. Um, and a great way to do that, well, before it's di more difficult now, but like going to a hackathon or um, working with people. So if you're in a club, you know, yeah, attend all the, all the clubs here, meeting people like that want to work on stuff or just, you know, finding people that want to work on a project is, is fantastic as well. Um, yeah, so the takeaway is basically you want to show people that you have coded before and you know how to code. And so the best way to do that is, you know, of course, do your homework in school, but also do a, do a personal project if you can. Um, otherwise, a list internship experience, list research, research experience. And um, it's pretty important how you list it. I would say it's important to be concise and quantify your contributions in a way that makes it very apparent that you're con contributing to the product. For example, like um, if you work on something and you said like, oh, I made th something 10% faster or 20% faster, or you can say like, I work on the front end for this product, right? It's much more concrete than saying like, than giving a broad, if you just, if your uh, resume line is just a description of what the product does. Um, it's much better if you say like, I did this, I did X, Y, and Z, like I made the React front end. Like that is much more concrete and it shows that like, okay, this, this person did this. Um, and of course, have your friends read it over. Um, one thing um, that wasn't included last year that I think is pretty important is um, there was the person who, actually this was his own side project, but there is an open API for a resume parsing software. And he literally just made a front end over it. Um, but you guys can check out this link. Basically you, op you um, upload your own CV and it just parses it. And it shows what a lot of companies, because a lot of companies use this API. So it'll show what the company sees. Because when you apply to companies, most of the time they're not physically reading your resume at first. It goes through resume parsing software and then they just see like the fill-in. So just say like name, major, 
And a lot of the time, if your resume is formatted strangely, then the problem is um, the uh, like your major or your GPA or whatever will all be wrong. So try this out, you know, put your current resume in and take a look. Um, beyond that, um, have your friends read over your resume. Um, it's good. <sighs> okay, so how do I apply? Uh, the first thing is the most popular and famous, obviously, is the summer like 10 to 12 week internship. Um, you can also uh, look at like the spring and fall internships. I would recommend it, although to a lot of people, it's pretty unorthodox to, you know, take a fall semester off or take like a spring semester off. But in my opinion, it's much, it's more, it's much more important to get work experience on the board before you graduate rather than like, you know, thinking about graduating as soon as possible. So for example, like if I got a, like a nice internship offered only in the fall, I would take it. Like it's not fantastic because like, then you're, you don't graduate with your friends and it doesn't feel great, but I would say it's in the long run, it's probably more, uh, it's probably more useful. Um, if, in addition, there's also the semester long co-ops. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done these personally, but I heard good things about them. So take a look. Um, so yeah, engineering, data science, all these roles, the bigger the company is, generally the more selective they are and the earlier, they, the, er, the more selective a company is, the earlier they start taking applications. So it kind of sucks I have to do this in October, but yeah, like um, if you guys are applying to like the Googles or the Facebooks, they probably opened in like July or August, honestly. Um, I would say they're all rolling acceptances. So they're just looking to fill up slots. I would apply as soon as possible. Even if you feel that like, you're underprepared or your resume could get better in the next couple of months, I think the best thing to do is to apply early because the worst thing that can happen is you apply in December and they're already all filled up and it doesn't matter how great your resume is if they have no room. Um, definitely apply as, as early as possible. This is way, way more important for these big companies if you guys are applying to those. Um, have your resume ready and know how to talk through your resume as well because just anticipate the fact that when you get an inter interview, there will, there will most definitely be a behavioral section where either the person asks you to say, you know, tell me about yourself or he or she will go through a specific lines about your resume and be like, oh, can you talk more about this project? Or can you talk more about, you know, X and Y and Z that you did? Um, so make sure all the points in your resume, you have more to elaborate on, you have something to talk about. And yeah, just be prepared in advance. Um, where, to, where to apply? So the most common is, you know, an online form with resume submission. So like, um, the easiest ones are if you see like LinkedIn easy apply where you just drop your resume in or like there are some websites, I think like Indeed or whatever, where like it's the feeling is very simple. It's like you just put your name, you, you put your, like, your name and you submit a resume and that's it. Those are the best because they take this, the shortest amount of time. I would definitely say in terms of applying for internships, it's more of a quantity over quality game, surprisingly. Um, I would for software engineering product and that kind of stuff, unless it's a local company, I would generally avoid cover letters. I don't think they're very useful and I don't think companies really read them, especially the big ones. They don't have time for that. Um, if you're looking, like let's say you've done research on a local company and you're looking, you know, specifically to talk to someone or you're emailing a person in particular, then, you know, the cover letters or the emails are much more meaningful. Um, but yeah, just in general, I would try to apply to as many companies as possible through online channels. And yeah, it's a lot of people throw out like hundreds and hundreds of applications. Don't stress yourself out over it. I would say like, you can just set a goal, maybe like do five or 10 a day and that's good enough. Like you, you don't need to sit there and just apply to like 300 in one day. Um, also it's, it's nicer if you find the ones that are really, really easy to apply to. Like you just have a resume ready, you put your name in and that's it. Um, um, and then more complicated is these like startups or sometimes with maybe they have an email uh, sitting somewhere or you have a contact, that's really great because you should email them directly and just, you know, say hi or attach a resume or something like that. Um, I would say these kinds of app applying. So especially if you know a local company or there's a company you're interested in and you can send them an email that gets read by a person, it's the chance of hearing back is much, much higher than if you just throw your, you know, resume through an online forum into the dark, like for one of these gigantic companies, because there's a high chance that gets parsed through software and no one ends up seeing it. Uh, lastly, you know, LinkedIn easy apply is really good because it's quick. Um, but yeah, you can, LinkedIn's also a good place to find job listings in general. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, 
the the best way I would say, apart from just applying online, the problem with applying online is, you know, each role you can imagine have has tens of thousands of applications. There's a really, really low chance that your resume gets looked at. And so the best thing you can do is, especially if you're a freshman or sophomore, is, you know, you can find a recruiter. And that's obviously easier said than done. But um, like if you went to like a job fair and you talked to someone or there was some online talk and a recruiter left his or her email, um, like starting a conversation or, you know, setting an email and just saying thanks or setting an email and saying, how, oh, oh, hi, I went to your talk and I'm interested in, in, in X and Y. Um, getting that like direct person contact is much, nets you a much higher chance of getting the job because, um, you know, you're talking to someone. Whereas if you throw your resume into the black hole of Google, no one's going to read it, probably. Um, so yeah, uh, on-campus recruitment, any way you can talk to a recruiter or talk to someone uh, is really nice. Um, Hackathons will also have recruiters generally, job fairs, and especially for these bigger companies, your chances go up exponentially if you have a referral from a friend. Um, it increases the chance that someone looks at your actual resume. Uh, quality tips, let's see. Yeah, keep track of the companies you applied to. You don't want to apply to the same one twice. Um, uh, if you start getting like, uh, I'll go over the process in a little bit, but generally there's like, you know, coding challenges and these interviews. It's nice to have like an Excel spreadsheet or some spreadsheet where you track, you know, where you are in the pipeline for all these companies. Um, this one is, uh, I think the, uh, the person who used to do this event with me, uh, Michael, would recommend having a separate email. I would just say be organized with your job applications and <laughs> have, have friends with cool jobs. That's a good one because um, then it, it, you have people to, to refer you. <laughs> But yeah, um, also, yeah, just go to a lot of events and meet new people. So interviewing, um, most, mostly these interviews are going to be remote interviews for now. But the traditional pipeline for interviewing, I would say, especially for bigger companies or mid-sized companies, is first you send in your resume, they send you a coding challenge. And then if you pass the coding challenge, then they give you a remote interview. And so usually what that means is you're on the phone with an interviewer and you're using a shared Google Doc or a shared screen where he or she is watching you code. And then basically you have to talk to the problem and while this person watches you code. Um, once you pass that, um, some companies will just do another one or that'll be the offer right there. Or some bigger companies will actually fly you to their headquarters or make you meet them at a location and you do an onsite interview. And an onsite interview generally encompasses like there's a whiteboard and you not only do you have to talk through the, they give you a problem and not only do you have to talk through it, but you have to write it um, using like a, like a marker or whatever. So there's no like syntax highlighting or anything like that. Um, but yeah, so generally it's coding challenge, um, phone interview, then onsite interview into an offer. Or nowadays, most likely what would happen is you have multiple uh, phone interviews or maybe like even like a video interview maybe, but just a couple of those, just cause most likely companies aren't flying you out right now. Um, so yeah, uh, be prompt in responding to your recruiter. I would say like, don't, don't leave your recruiter hanging for like more than a couple of days. I, I would just respond immediately. Um, uh, try your best to not push back interview dates, schedule them as soon as possible to give yourself the highest chance because understand that recruiting is all rolling admissions. So once they close up slots, they're done. Um, okay. So yeah, the, I would say most interviews, have two parts. There's the behavioral section and the technical section. So the first to describe the behavioral section, it generally goes, they go, tell me about yourself, or they look at your resume and they ask you, you know, some project that you did or something that's on your resume. So a brief introduction, you should prepare like a one and a half minute, one minute introduction. That's pretty brief and concise that tells the recruiter about yourself. Like you can say like, oh, I major in this, like I've, took, I've taken these classes and I like to, I, I like to work on this and this on the side. And then the recruiter might, um, the interviewer might um, make you elaborate on some of the points you mentioned, and then you go, go from there. So yeah, uh, be able to introduce yourself, um, show, be, have a lot of talking points in, just prepared beforehand. So like, you know, things that, show, things that show that you do stuff. So things you do at school, your club, if you work before, awesome. Um, this is much more important for mid-size and local companies, I would say, is like, if you have specific interest in the company, um, I would say for big companies, most of them probably don't ask like, oh, why do you want to work here? Because I feel like, oh, and if you do, if you do get asked that question, do not say the reputation is great because they know that. So 
Um, it's best if you have some answer, but I have rarely been asked that. So, um, but smaller companies, if you do your research and you find out like what they're about, what they do, um, if you can talk a little bit about that, it looks good for you. Um, yeah, prepare talking points. And then at the end of an interview, oh, so that was the behavioral section. And then usually after that, they'll just dig into a technical section, which is they ask you a question, watch you code it, watch you talk to the solution. I'll go a little bit more into that later. But yeah, at the end of the interview, when you're done with everything, they say like, oh, I have a couple minutes. Do you have any questions for me? Never say no, I have no questions because that looks bad on you. So just prepare some questions as like, especially they might take a minute or two to talk about themselves. And they might say like, oh, I work on, you know, like site efficiency or I work on blah, blah, blah. You can just ask like, oh, what is the culture of your team like? Like, um, especially if maybe you're recruiting for a full-time position, you can, you can be like, what is the on-call experience like? You know, what's the work environment like? What's, you know, favorite thing about work, exciting, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, coding challenge, phone screen, and then on-site interview. Uh, generally for interns, you will probably only do about one or two at most. Full-time, you can do anywhere from like one to four, so it can get rough, but um, I would say uh, large and mid-sized companies, they mostly focus on these, you know, these algorithmic, like lead code type questions, if you've heard of them. And then if they're not your forte, um, obviously it's good to practice, but usually the uh, local and smaller companies will have a tendency to ask more behavioral stuff, or they'll ask if you have experience with a certain like tool or language that they use a lot. Um, sometimes you get a mix of like a mix of both where they ask you about like a certain tool or language that you have listed, or sometimes they'll just ask you like a, t a technical lead code coding question. Um, so preparing for the coding interview, go to my event next week. That's a, always a good one. Um, but just in general, I would say there's a lot to know here. The, the best thing first is have taken data structures. Um, basic algorithms here is, okay at helping you, but I'd say algorithms encompasses most of it. Um, if you have time to, and you want to brush up the things you know, I would read a book called Cracking the Coding Interview. Um, I would go through just maybe the first seven or eight chapters has most of the important things. Um, there's a lot of stuff I have listed on the slide, but the most important and things that get asked most often are like hash maps, um, arrays, recursion, linked list, and graphs, I think. Um, depending, the difficulty for interns is definitely lower than full-time, but if you're going for full, a full-time interview, then you should try to have everything down. So that'll encompass like dynamic programming and all these, you know, a lot, there's a lot more stuff. Um, just in general, I would say to get practice, um, read CTCI, cracking the coding interview. Um, you can go to lead code and click, um, top interview questions. I think most of those are decent. Uh, what I would do is on the code, you can sort by like accepted. And so like, that's the percentage of the time that a user submission gets accepted. And so it's kind of like an artificial, like difficulty tracker. So like the easiest questions are at the top. I would just start with some of the easier ones, I think, and work down. Um, the, the most important thing I'd say for these interviews is a lot of people have uh, the wrong idea where they think the way to pass the interview is to just get the right answer and get the best answer in the fastest time possible. But just in general, when the interviewer hangs up on you, like they want, what's most important is like, they have a good idea of who you are and how you think as a person, I think. So what that means is it's not just about getting the best answer with the best runtime. It's you being able to articulate how you think and how you arrived at that answer. So, so a lot of the time, even if your answer isn't the most optimal one, as long as you can talk about, you know, runtime complexity and memory and trade-offs and stuff like that, even if your answer wasn't optimal, if they, if you leave a good impression by the way you articulate yourself and um, the guy leaves the room thinking, wow, this person has a good knowledge of data structures, even though he didn't get the perfect answer here, he has a good understanding of, you know, how can I speed up my algorithm by adding additional memory or stuff like that. Um, so I'll go into that more next week, of course, but yeah, just in general, it's, I would say, try to get practice, um, like talking as you code, because that's definitely something that it's not easy. Um, for example, like, you can just try in the beginning, like reversing a linked list while you talk through why you're adding the lines you are. So, you know, say like, oh, I have a pointer here and a pointer here. Like it's, it's not so easy. So definitely practice. If you have a friend who can, like you can go back and forth with. So for example, like he asks you a question and then, you know, you're typing with him or her and then they're watching like what you, they're watching what you say and you're talking to that person and then you go back and forth. It's a good way to get practice.
Um, other than that, like there are good websites that go through some of the most popular interview questions. I'd say Geek for, Geeks for Geeks is pretty good. LeetCode is probably where you'll get most of your practice. Um, another note on LeetCode, don't do the hard questions for now, especially if you're an, you're an intern. I think a lot of people have this misconception that like the top companies like only ask leak code hard questions, but that's, that's not really a thing. So in general, I would say be really comfortable doing a lot of the easier problems. And then I, I would say a lot of companies probably ask easy, medium ish questions. The, the, the difficulty on the site is not like a great indicator of the question, but um, yeah, just in general, sometimes the hard questions are really obscure and they don't teach you much. Um, yeah, read cracking the coding interview. Um, and you can see what kinds of questions that specific companies like to ask if you're interested in that. So if you're, if you're saying I have an interview with X company, then you can look like at Glassdoor and you'll say, oh, maybe Google really likes to ask dynamic programming questions uh, or something, something like that. Um, yeah, so be comfortable with the language. I would highly recommend Python, but use what's more comfortable for you because generally speaking, it looks a little weird if you hop into a shared coder pad with an interviewer and then you're like struggling to type like public void, static main or whatever. Um, just be comfortable. I'd recommend Python because it's, it's the simplest, but you can use almost this. Most of the popular languages are out there. Um, yeah, make sure your like your naming conventions are good. Your style conventions are good. If you're interviewing and they see that you're naming your variables like something ridiculous, it doesn't, you know, keep it simple. Um, if you're doing a front end or design interview, yeah, you know, JavaScript, CSS, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes for these designy front end interviews, they will ask you like to, you know, use it, like use a framework you're comfortable with or to, you know, modify something. Um, just have stuff you're comfortable with for sure. And if you're not sure what an interview will encompass, um, because sometimes you don't know if it's an algorithmic interview or if it's like a behavioral interview or it's a mix of both, just ask your recruiter like, hey, can, can you talk a little bit more about the interview process? Um, yeah. Uh, I have not tried these sites uh, myself, but um, I would say it's more important than just being able to solve the problem. Again, like you want to be able to talk as you solve the problem. So, you know, get a friend or yeah, get a friend to, you know, watch you grill you on behavioral questions, especially your resume, and then also like technical questions. Um, deciding, uh, this is like, uh, if you have multiple offers, like generally speaking, you wanna have your applications be around the same time because then hopefully you're interviewing and when your offers come in are around the same time as well. So you can decide between them rather than if you, let's say you apply to a company early and then you got an offer really early, you have to decide, do I wanna work with this company or not right there? And then all the other applications you have are void, which is pretty annoying. So yeah, you can ask for extensions, but um, depending on the company, the time you have can be a couple of weeks to a couple of months. But yeah, you can ask for extensions, but a lot of companies just say no. So um, it's a little risky. Just try to apply it around the same time. Um, for this semester, that would be like right now, or like if you haven't already, apply like right now. Um, compensation, I think I had, a, I had a TA who mentioned he doesn't believe in unpaid internships. Um, for me, I would say, yeah, there are especially a lot of like startups that are unpaid. I would generally trend towards like doing something else like research or like doing a project on my own rather than working unpaid. Um, unless you feel like you can gain something like really meaningful from the internship. Um, another thing is like, if you're graduating soon, like your junior offer is the most important because uh, your return offer there is the full-time offer, right? So if you're a sophomore, like you, you might get a return offer back to that company as an intern again but the company you choose to work for as a junior um, should be a company that you're willing to work for full-time because the offer you return, if you do well there, is going to be a full-time offer. Um, think about like where the jobs are. So for example, like, do I wanna be in, you know, New York City, San Francisco, Seattle, maybe I wanna be in, you know, like Texas even, or like think about the location that's pretty important because it's like a long-term decision, especially for full-time. Or you could even take internships as an experience or time to try locations you wouldn't otherwise be in. So yeah, uh, I think at least for me, like one of the goals was to get out of New York because um, I go to like, I go to school here and I, I grew up here. Um, so yeah, uh, also the role, if the team is, has something you're interested in, like, especially like, you know, it'd be like machine learning, you put 
self-driving, you know, these are other factors you can consider and size. Um, do you want to, do you want to try working for a big company, a small company? Um, the nice thing about bigger companies is generally speaking, there will be more interns. And so, you know, there's other people you can talk to and meet, which is cool. And like, maybe I want to try a, a larger, small team and then really unsure. Uh, oh, you can look at Reddit and blind for reviews on your company. Although yeah, take them with a grain of salt because eh, it's kind of hit or miss. Um, and yeah, think about like where you want to be and will this company position, you know, get me to where I want to end up at. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, Glassdoor, you can look for reviews and yeah, uh, I mentioned this before, but yeah, no internship, no problem. The, it's much more difficult to get an internship as a freshman or a sophomore, just because as I mentioned, um, companies want juniors because companies want full-time employees. And the easiest way to, to nab a full-time employee is to offer them an internship in their junior summer. And then they can give them an offer that they take. So they lock that person in after they graduate. Um, so I would say, um, especially if you're a freshman or sophomore, the most important thing is like you're preparing your resume up for when you become a junior, because you want your resume to be as strong as possible when you start applying as a junior. And so, um, that doesn't like, obviously if you can get an internship, that's fantastic. But if you can't, there's, you know, as I, all the things I mentioned earlier, like the research, personal projects, anything that can land, land you something on your GitHub is good. Uh, yeah. Project clubs, personal side projects. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Closing thoughts is, you know, you have your whole life to work. So relax, travel, not now, but in general, like don't beat yourself up if, you know, you don't get an internship. It's not the end of the world. Like it's, it's that's not the only thing. Um, but yeah, if uh, you're really career oriented and you want to like do everything you can to, you know, get an internship as a junior, um, then yeah. Hackathons, you know, clubs, anything where you can like, work on a project or just work on a project on your own even. But yeah. So uh, I guess we can go to, go to questions now. Yeah. Uh, get this. I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to know like your personal experience on like how did you apply or like, how did you break it down? Like, I know you mentioned it a little bit, but like, did you have a strategy? Like, did you use an Excel sheet? Um, like what companies did you target? Um, like, did you split the targets up, like split the companies up? Uh, so like before I had uh, like my first internship, like I was kind of okay with working anywhere. So uh, for me, it was just like, if I got any offer, I would be happy. Right. So, uh, yeah, I kept the spreadsheet of the companies I applied to. Obviously, the first thing I did was I applied to all the companies I've heard of. And then um, if I knew someone who worked there, like that's a huge bonus because I asked for a referral. Um, but otherwise, like, you know, I just look online if they have like a resume thing open or whatever. Um, I kept track of it, yeah, through an Excel, Excel spreadsheet. And um, let's see, my uh, and my resume before I had any work experience was... Uh, so I guess this is like a good tip for people who are uh, are struggling to talk about like themselves in an interview. So for me, like, as I mentioned earlier, like if you put like sales associated Hollister, it's not fantastic. Cause like, it doesn't tell the interviewer or the recruiter anything about you, right. In terms of like technical, you know, interview uh, coding related stuff. Um, but the nice thing is, so like I interned at like this bank doing honestly, like nothing, right. It was like, I was doing like, uh, like, Paper, like busy work, like paperwork, I guess. And so like the reason I, ha I left that on my resume is like one reason, like one thing I could have done is taken it off. But what I did was I said, as a sophomore, I said in my interviews, I would go, oh, as a freshman, you know, I was originally working in a finance role and I really didn't like it. So I spent the summer doing um, X, Y, and Z side project. And I started picking up, you know, these, these languages and these tools. And it like kind of builds a story that you can talk about yourself with when they ask you, you know, tell me about yourself. So it's nice if your like resume and what you have to say about yourself kind of like has synergy and like you can, you know, use that to build a story about yourself. Other than that, I literally had, um, I had one project from school and like three dinky projects I work on. They're like nothing impressive, but like it, um, like you'd just be able to talk about them a little bit more, like a couple of minutes in your, in your interviews and you're fine. I went to Hack NYU like once 
and I did kind of, I did like a part of the front end and I just talked about that. No, nothing, nothing crazy, nothing like you guys here can't do, but um, just having something to talk about with, with your interviewer is good. And so like my, yeah, my resume was that non CS internship four projects and then like the languages I'd used and the classes I took. Yeah. Yeah. So anything else? Thank you. Yeah, you're um, welcome. We have about like 10 minutes. If like, if you guys are shy and don't want to unmute yourself, you feel free to put it in the chat and like, we could just read it out to Andrew. Um, oh yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, yeah, feel free to just chat the, the questions if you like. What, okay, so I guess like, it seems like most of us here are freshmen. Oh wait, okay, we have a question. Do you have any tips for people who are just starting out and have limited or no tech experience? Uh, so I would say the most important thing is, so like, uh, the, the best thing is, so if you're a freshman or sophomore and you're interviewing, any, interviewing anywhere, um, generally they give you more leeway, um, especially if you haven't like taken, you know, data structures or th these classes, like they'll be more understanding. Uh, like I know, I know someone who like interviewed for Google as a freshman and she like in her interview room, they gave her a question. She literally said, oh, I haven't taken data structures yet. And then they just gave her a different question, right? So it's not like, I think they're like relatively understanding. Um, but just in general, take data structures as soon as you can. Um, and then beyond that, it, like to a lot of people, I know it will seem like really daunting to go and like learn something on your own. For example, like let's say I've never made a website. It seems like really like insurmountable to like make go make a website on your own. But really a lot of it is just like going on Google and literally going like, how do I make a website or like see like HTML tutorial for beginners. And it's like a lot of that stuff is like Googleable and way less daunting and like challenging than you think. It's just about like um, having the interest and like the passion, I think, and like the willingness to learn. Um, so yeah, if there's anything you wanted to ever make, like, or, or even better, like if you took a class that used X or Y language, like you can build off that by like being, getting more experience with that language or tool using like by building something you want to build. So just like, yeah, just build anything, I think is a good, a good start. Yeah. Um, so what do you think, like when getting your junior year internship, what do you think was like the main selling point on your resume or like the main selling point that you think like made them like, oh, I want this kid. Uh, I work for Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay. So if you have like a nice, a good company on your resume, it obviously looks way better, but so like juniors look more appealing just in general. But, um, if you have like some big, uh, some work experience or some accom accomplishment or some research, generally your, your resume will already look pretty good. And the biggest thing is like, I got referrals as well. My, even though like, even with like a nice resume, a lot of companies I applied for that I didn't have referrals for, I didn't get a response from. So it's not like, oh, you have a, 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 a nice internship on your resume and suddenly every company is trying to hire you. That's like not how that works. Like I'm still throwing online applying. Like for example, I applied to like, I applied to Uber. They didn't get back to me, right? Just cause they have hundred thousand applications and my resume is not too bad, but like they have so many applications and I don't have a referral. So if you can get your foot in the door with like a referral, it looks way better even if your resume is not like, you know, like anything crazy. Um, I would say just try to have some work experience, wh whether that be an internship or research or at least a couple of hackathons, um, that would look good by the time you're a junior. Yeah. Yeah, so if there's any other questions, you can throw them out now, or I guess we're just wrapping up. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, can you elaborate more on the point where you said you don't believe in networking? Oh, no, no, wait, I never, I never <laughs> said like, I don't, I don't believe in networking. Um, so like, um, networking is like really, really good just in general, because like even, so let's say I want to apply, my goal is to get into like, you know, Google or whatever, like some of these, big, no, you're good. Uh, so like some of these big companies, um, like I, as I said, like if you apply online, you're throwing your resume into this black hole of like. 10,000 resumes, you might not get looked at, but if there's a Google recruiter on campus or in our career fair, and you hand your resume directly to that person, or you talk to that person and they leave an email, 
um, it's, there's a much higher chance your resume gets actually looked at and your chances are much better. Um, and even stronger with local companies or smaller companies is like, um, if you network and like you talk to someone and you hand your resume directly to them, it's a lot more meaningful because, you know, maybe they only have like a hundred people applying. And if you're that person who you met in person and you left a good impression in person and you handed a resume over, there's a really, really good chance the person they want to hire is you. Um, what level of proficiency in a language or technology should we have before we start applying to internships? I would say it's always, it's always better to apply early. Like one mistake I had, so like I didn't start taking any CS classes until I was a sophomore. Cause like I, uh, I guess I was like a double major. And so I didn't start taking CS until I was a sophomore. And when I was a sophomore, I was thinking, oh, I'm not good enough yet. So let me go practice and I'll go apply in a month. Well, guess what happened? I, I waited like three months to apply and everything closed. And I was like, well, well that was great. So um, what I would do is you're always going to, a lot of people are always going to feel like, you know, they're not good enough or they can go practice for one more week or one more month and they can apply. Just apply as soon as possible. Like it's better to get the interview experience like early on. And if you're really that worried, I would say like, just start practicing right now. Right. And then like send out your applications because they will take at least three or four weeks before they get back to you. And so like, at least you have that time, right? Um, and just, there's, there's no like baseline. Obviously it's, I, as I mentioned, it's better if you've taken data structures, but there's no like level where it's like, oh, I can solve this now and now I'm ready, right? So yeah, um, as, um, as uh, Jennifer said in the chat, attend company events. Yeah, if company events like are really, really great. Cause as I mentioned, like networking is great. If you can talk to someone and get your resume to a person or get an email, that is way, way better than just applying online where your, your percent chance of getting looked at is like 1%. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Um, so if you're setting yourself up for like, I guess, um, full-time offers, like, do you think like for, for example, on your junior internship, do you think it's better to aim for internships that have a specific role you're interested in? Or for example, like a company that you're more interested in, if that makes sense. Um, I would say the role is probably more important because it's like what you're doing like when you graduate, right? So mm -hmm. like if, like, let's say I have like a software engineer, like let's say I want to do software engineering and I have a software engineering offer at a company, at company A and like a product design offer at company B. If software engineering is what I want to do, like it's not super simple to, you know, change your role at a company or across companies in particular. So you probably want to start full-time with the role you're interested in. Um, and then beyond that, it's about like picking the company you would rather work at, I think. Yeah. Okay, solid, thanks. Yeah, so anything else? Hey, Andrew, how would you cool. recommend getting good enough at Python to interview in it, given that none of the coursework is in Python? Um, the easiest way is, I would say, is probably just do a project in Python. like. Um, just as um, to start off, thankfully, like Python is one of the more simple, I think it's one of the easiest and syntactically friendly languages. And so like just making anything in Python is, uh, will, will help you like get your foot in the door. And then beyond that, um, when you go on sites like LeetCode or, you know, when you solve it and practice interview problems, um, just use Python more. And as you use the language more, um, you'll get more comfortable using it. Yeah. So, yeah, there's anything else we got four minutes left. Uh, yeah. I guess other than that, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to post the slides shortly after and most of this was recorded. So you'll be able to see that on our page. So yeah, follow us and be sure to come to my event next week as well. <laughs> uh, Jen has one question in the oh, chat. Yeah. Oh, what do you think of, oh, oh, what do you think of reneging on an offer? So reneging, for those of you who are not aware, is accepting an offer and then saying no, like after. Um, so I think re reneging in general is like, among a lot of people, it's considered really, really taboo. It's like, they feel like what they think is, or what I've heard at least is some people say like, the moment you renege an offer, they blacklist you forever or something, or like you can never work there ever again. Um, I would say in general, avoid it if you can, right? Um, as I, cause I said earlier, sometimes like 
you want to get all your applications in at the same time. But a lot of the time what happens is companies get back to you at different time points. And so you start interviewing and you're in the pipeline at different points with different companies. And so your offers come in at different times. Um, so what happens then is, you know, maybe you got like a startup offer and you like it and you signed it, but then later down the road, like, I don't know, Buzzfeed got back to you. And obviously you want to work for Buzzfeed, right? Way more. So you're in this tough spot where like, do I renege? I would say in general, it is not as bad as you think, surprisingly. Um, as long as you're like pretty courteous about it, just send an email like, hey, I'm no longer, or like, I'm no longer able to uh, you know, take this position, et cetera. Um, there is a chance that it is much harder to get into that company again. So keep that in the back of your mind. But I would say it's like, if you were an egg on like Google or something, they're not like, we have you on a list forever. Like you can never come back. I don't think it's like that. As long as you're pretty courteous about it, like reneging is not the worst thing in the world. And sometimes it leads you to a better opportunity that you had, right? So it's probably worth it. Um, international students, um, a lot of applications, they make you list if you need um, visa sponsorship. Um, it's definitely more, more difficult to get an internship because um, the number of students they can sponsor like visas for and stuff like that is much lower. Um, but I would say, I know a lot of people who are a lot of international students who ended up with offers anyway. So it's definitely doable. Yeah. We got a minute. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Sweet. So Thanks, we'll just Andrew. post this to YouTube and shit, right? <laughs> yeah, awesome. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. That was so good. Yeah, yeah that was pretty forget. good. Thank mm -hmm. you. Awesome. Yes. For the rest of the people in here, um, don't forget to um, join our Slack if you haven't done so already. Um, we post um, all of our events on there and like any updates and opportunities on there as well. Yeah, but thank you for coming, everyone. Yeah, Yay. thanks for coming up, everybody. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Let me, that. Let me turn off recording.